Hello and welcome to Season 4 of the Sunday Podcast, presented by SportsShoes.com. I'm Ollie Lum. And I'm Matt Seddon. This podcast is all about elite distance running in the UK. We're here to give you all the latest news updates around the sport. As well as weekly interviews with athletes and coaches. Stay up to date by following us on Instagram and X at Sunday Podcast. And make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel too, where we post athlete workout videos, shoe reviews and more. Thanks for listening. And as always, we hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, welcome back to another episode. As you can see from the title, um, we've got Ava Lloyd coming up later on in the episode as she approaches um, World Juniors in Peru. But um, yeah, first mate, a few Diamond Leagues to get stuck into. Yeah man, first one first one post games. Um, and my biggest takeaway straight away, I'm just going to go out there and say it. I think, I personally think the only man capable of breaking the 1500 world record in the near future is, is Jakob Ingebrigtsen. That might sound dumb, because obviously you know he hasn't he hasn't won a championship fifteen hundred in a little while now. But he's just shown again, like from this diamond league, it was just clear to me that he's the only man capable of actually taking a race on and pushing the pace in the third lap. And I look at people like Hocker and uh, even even Kerr to an extent. I mean the Goose as well. Like these guys, like yes, um, they can front run at a slightly slower speed, at kind of like a three thirty and a three thirty one, and maybe kick off of that. But I don't think they've got it in them to like 150 through 800 and maintain. And, and you know, Jakob's on, everyone's emotionally drained post Olympics. Jakob still goes and runs 327. And, you know, he's, he's just the best guy in a pace race, full stop. But every single world record the athlete is required to do, whether it be the last five, 600 of a 1500, you know, in 5,000, you've got to do that last couple of Ks on your own and so on. And every world record that you've seen, the athletes have just been able to push and push and push completely solo. And I just think the only man, if we are going to see a world record in this era, the only man I think that might come from is Jakob. I might eat my own words. People like Hocker and Kerr might just improve tremendously and have the ability to do it. But this year and going into next year, and what we keep forgetting is Jakob's still only, what, is he 23 years of age or something? So he's still, you know, the record could come from this guy when he's like 24, 25 in the next couple of years. So, but that was my biggest takeaway. Obviously, you know, Kessler, Hocker and the rest of the field, um, I mean, Hocker and Kessler still ran pretty well, I think, but um, obviously just didn't quite have that same same energy that we saw from them at the Olympic Games. Um, and then the rest of the field, it just showed, man. They struggled, you know. The pace early was hot. Everyone kind of goes with it on the rail. And then, yeah, you can just see those guys who just... It was like, you know, people like McSwain and Hoare and stuff, like just, yeah, struggling to... Uh, to really hold it and I guess showing where they are kind of post Olympics and the kind of effects of the Olympics um, and that's what's so impressive about Jakob because we'll get on to the men's 800 as well because that was ridiculous but I think his ability to just go and go and go and he's bloody lined up for the 3000 on, on Sunday night to, today when you're listening people yeah I think you're bang on about a world record mate and I also think it puts puts Hisham's record in perspective in oh, the, does, man. the fact he's done that um, and they're still not not touching it with the amount of tech depth, support tech the amount of races that are basically set up yeah. to run that um, like back in the day you weren't getting opportunities like that to run to run sub 330 just week in week out essentially um, like you you did really have to go out on your own whereas yeah, yeah obviously Jakob's going out on his own but he does know he's got a whole host of guys who can run under 330 in the race um, without a doubt so we didn't I, like back in the day as well like watching a lot of races I'm only going off of, like races I've watched on YouTube of like past world records and stuff in the 1500 obviously I wasn't alive to follow the sport that that in detail then when people like Cram and Co were breaking records but like it was rare these guys would get a pacemaker to a thousand metres or even kind of you know 1100 metres that sort of thing it was so rare that that would happen but that seems to be becoming more and more and more common um, so they're getting, like you said, way more support. They've got the lights as well to make those kind of first few laps very, very even. Um, it does put into perspective how good that record is and whether we'll see whether we'll see this era break it. I don't know. Yeah, I think even if we do, even if we do see it go, um, it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean it's a better performance. I think in the past few years we've realised that about most of our most of our world records, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, um, 100%. And yeah, and I think, I mean, you were saying 
you know, like the way Jakob's still kind of like, you know, he wins the Diamond League again and he's kind of like, you know, got a bit of swagger again. He was making a few remarks um, about, yeah, <laughs> good quote that he made after this one. I don't know if, you know, people saw it, but um, basically saying like, if you can't run for three, three and a half minutes and then two weeks later come and do it again, um, you've got a big problem. <laughs> Almost like disregarding the fact that people are fatigued and emotionally drained after the Olympics and, and they're tired and stuff. But, you know, I, mentally, I mean, he's he's one of a kind, the way that he can just carry his momentum through. Um, yeah, it's interesting you say that because I, I used to think, yeah, Jakob was mentally ridiculous. But actually now I've decided, I think it's a bit of a front, to be honest. Because, I don't know, some of those comments, like, mate, you should have just done the job. A few weeks ago, Dude, and you, you would not feel like you need to say these things, to be honest. Um, yeah, like it's all very, it's all well and good, but I actually think the best thing that could happen to him is if he'd come out and actually lost, and then he might actually take stock and think, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe I, I'm not the best in pace races, like I'm not unbeatable in them, and look, I've lost the Olympics as well. Maybe I need to start doing something about it, to be honest, because. Yeah, you think the whole time he's winning and beating these guys on the circuit. I just think, yeah. yeah. It just it just papers over his cracks that he clearly has in championship races. It's not happened yeah. just once. It's three times on the bounce now. Yeah. It's intriguing. A few people, I guess, um, yeah, that was the men's 1500, really. It was, it was the Jakob show. Mm. Uh, we're going to get that great 1500 to come. In Zurich, early September, where we're, obviously we're going to see Nagus Hocker and Jakob and, and Kerr go at it. I wouldn't mind betting someone drops drops out of the race. Maybe not actually. There's too much money on the line. But talking of kind of news, obviously Keeley's called her season. Claims she's got a bit of an injury. Um, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe she does. But also, I think there is. When you're in her position, I think you've just got so much to lose at this stage in the season. I think a lot of athletes, they've got so much to gain because there's just so much financial reward on yeah. the line. So every time you tow the line, your race fees are probably double. You know, your appearance um, fees are probably double. But I think Keeley, commercially, will just sweep up way more cash Yeah. between now and the end of the season. And if she was continuing the rest of the season, I think she would have to turn down so many kind of like commercial deals and... All these, all this stuff she's about to get invited to that we don't even know because um, it's probably so exclusive premieres and all this kind of yeah. stuff. Um, dude, she's she's just gonna absolutely make way more than she would on the track. Um, but look, I'm not I'm not saying she's not injured. She probably is injured, but you know, is it something that? Because earlier there were rumors of like her kind of trying to chase the world record before the season's out mm. and stuff. So, you know, is it? Is it kind of more they don't want to take risks and you know there's a lot to lose at this stage and I think there's a lot to lose financially but also going into next year if you go yeah. into next year beat up banged up in October how's that going to kind of affect momentum? Yeah, absolutely. Me, like she might like yeah. If she hadn't just won the Olympics, it could be an injury that yeah you probably could race through or kind of patch yourself up. But look, if she's got any sort of niggle. There's no need to be doing anything at all. Um, so yeah, I think I think good decision to be honest, whether whether she is or she isn't, um, because yeah, nothing nothing to race for for her, um, and and also I think the particularly with the expectation she had um, from I guess not just athletics fans, but in, in general when people started realizing our oh, GB in the athletics have a, a real kind of gold medal contender in Keely Hodgkinson, that kind of emotional pressure to to get the job done and I know mm. we all expected her to do it but sometimes I'm sure that's worse for these athletes you know um, I just feel you, number one 100% so. you've got to be able to enjoy the moment though as well and you know we've always said haven't we how athletes I mean look it's their job right to, to kind of toe the line and, and, and this is kind of a period where they cash in but how they do continue their season after such an achievement, like yeah. the, for me, the motivation would just never be there. So I, like, yeah, you've got to be able to enjoy it. Like, it may never happen again. You know, in four years' time, like, I know we said a few weeks ago that I think it is going to be the Keeley show. It's going to be Keeley zero for the next mm. three, four years, maybe, until someone comes along that can challenge her. You know, provided she stays healthy. Um, so she might win again, but it's very unlikely. That you're going to get two Olympic medals 
four years, two Olympic golds, four years apart. So yeah, and and three medals in three games. Um, Crap! Yeah, would even be would yeah. be crazy. Um, Silver, gold, and yeah. Well, look at all the people. Look at all the favourites. I say favourites. Look at all the people, like who who three years ago you thought thought were probably locks, right? Like, look at I think about someone like Warhong, for example, in the four hurdles. Yeah, how how he went from being unbeatable, yeah, and then biggest stage on earth. He's obviously he's just not quite there. Like, and it's how quickly that can happen. So, yeah, yeah, literally very very few athletes capable of doing that. But uh, but I guess that's that's Keeley and. Uh, Neil Gawley's got an injury and interestingly you know Neil Gawley by the way um, if people follow him on Instagram you probably all do but yeah came out and apparently did a 143.9 time trial by the way in Chiavenna pre-Olympic Games I think he was looking forward to lining up in that 800 and it was electric we'll get onto that the one in Luzanne the other night but uh, but yeah he's decided to call his season as well he's got a little calf strain um, and I think again for someone who's missed quite a few winters in his career He's very concerned about kind of getting a. He's got. Mm-hmm. He's, we said before then. He's got to get a full winter in him to see what can this guy do. Can he be a three twenty seven, three twenty eight guy? Um, we've always kind of thought he could, right? But yeah. he's just never, never been kind of had that perfect preparation. If there's such thing, but but mate, let's um, the men's fifteen hundred. Yeah, we just kind of dissected a little bit. Men's eight. Whew. Let's do it, man. Wow. Yeah, obviously, Juan Yoni taking the win, 141-1-1. We're getting close, mate, and I, I <laughs> did not think we would be saying that at the start of this season. The 800 is, on the men's side anyways, is an event that we have seen, not a lack of like talented athletes, but just a lack of fast races in the past few years. Uh, I think we've had we've had good athletes. Look, they're all the same ones that kind of have been on the circuit for the last, last few years or so, but... Yeah, since it was that one race, um, was it Paris? The Paris Diamond League was the first one, I believe. Yeah, Paris, then Monaco, then then obviously the Paris Olympics, um, and now in Lausanne as well. They they are just every time they mm-hmm. they going out and getting after it. And I think it is just they've just realised okay now that's now that's the standard, and they've all been like okay we'll just we'll just run fast. Um, yeah. Do you do you think we will see? a world record soon um, and will it be Wang Yongi or like, the thing is so many others are also yeah. so close that actually it's not like we've got one guy no the others ripping it up for me for me there's there's, there's two guys and honestly I just think it's yeah it's Wang Yongi or A-Rob they're the only two they're, for me they look like the only two who can actually run who can run a 49 through that first lap 49 low in a mm. relaxed manner Everyone else is just kind of like they they wouldn't be able to hit the front and to go through in forty nine um, behind the pacemaker and kind of continue to build. Um, I looked at Wang Yonyi's splits by the way. Is, I think it was his from five hundred to six hundred hundred split was one of his fastest of the whole race. Um, I can't remember exactly what it is, but I think it was a low twelve um, outrageous bar the kind of first hundred or um, so. Yeah, I just don't see anyone else actually being able to run that fast being up at the front competing for the win I think they can they can get dragged round um, hence why they're running so fast but it's like in the 1500 you know that they just can't make that next step so the world record is definitely coming from one of those two I think even Sajati I'm not sure he's got it in his locker wherever he may be um, but a man like what was he d- honestly I think it looked like they had some sort of arrangement when a just drifted out down the back straight he let Wanyoni come to on the inside and then just kind of slotted in behind him it was so weird and then mm. continued to challenge him down the home straight um, it was one of the craziest of the craziest 800s that I've seen in a long long time but Wanyoni the only thing I think like I think there's faster tracks out there than Luzanne to be honest I think there's probably you know maybe better conditions I don't know but um but the only thing I think he did have a beautifully set up race like Pacer Arop came through on the inside battled down the home straight you know had a little battle with Arop so it was almost yeah it was it was inch perfect and and what did Radisha do when he first I think Radisha around 141.09 in in Berlin when he first broke the world record and then one and then 140.91 so yeah. yeah we are getting stupidly stupidly close ladies and gentlemen um whether we'll see it at the end of the season, I I don't know. Yeah, I'm just looking at the splits as well. And Wanyoni actually went fifty point zero 
on the on the first lap. Yeah. Like his split. Um, and I actually think that's a really really sensible way to do it. To be honest, so if he can just, I don't think he needs to run forty nine low. I think he just needs to run like forty nine eight, forty nine seven. Yep. Um, and that actually puts you in in a better position. To be honest, but yeah, because because Radisha was not was not that quick through four hundred, considering that the obviously the one forty. Um, back when he did it. Yeah, so. Radish was 49 point, right? But, um, yeah, there you go. 12-4, 12, 12, his 100 from 500 to 600 is was the fastest of the race bar the, bar the back straight on the first lap as well. So, um, showing that that kind of, I remember Radish did the same, that, that third 200 down the back straight. Just got another gear. The only thing I would say about the eight, like these guys have maintained that form now, just pre-Olympics, through the Olympics, and now, mm to Lausanne surely at some point that, that strength because they've been racing so much they surely haven't been able to do quite as much training surely that will start to start to dip away be some feet if come the end of the season your end of an Olympic season they run they run a world record that would just be um, so that's my only kind of reservations like whether they'll get the job done this year um, yeah you'd think you'd get hard wouldn't you but this, this year who knows mate who mm. knows then women's eight, um, George Bell continued to impress on tired legs. I mean, I, I, I thought she could have challenged for the win. To be fair, she looked in a great spot, just kind of then just sort of at the 600 meter mark positioning was pretty rough, let a few people go by. But then, you know, her strength in the last 50 is just second to none. Yeah. Do you think it's almost a case of like just being, not that she's not used to winning, but not used to winning on this level that. She's almost just not quite putting herself in the position. Not quite to brave enough. For, I think the eight hundred, you know, eight hundred is definitely a tricky one because I mean the fifteen hundreds that she's run, like since let's say British Champs, like she's a great tactical fifteen hundred runner, but you know there hasn't been much tactics involved. It's just hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Yeah. Um, and obviously this eight hundred, there was a little bit more. I think she could have paid. At that 600 meter mark, she could have paid a lot closer order to Mary Moore. Like, mm. I think she could have, she could have challenged for the win. Um, but she was tired and and whatnot. Post Olympics, we understand that. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think she wants to do the Diamond League final in the 800. So I think we're going to see more of her. And yeah, I, I think she can run at 155. I really do. Yeah, I mean, no Keeley as well. Maybe she's thinking that's the that's the title she can actually come away with the Diamond League victory. You know. Yeah, and versus the fifteen, for example, we know what that means. We know that means you get that you get a bypass to Tokyo. Um, Does she double in Tokyo? Yeah, yeah. Now that would be a story. She's bloody capable of it. To yeah. be honest, I love to see Keely do the same as well. To be honest, that's that's <laughs> my on my, my kind. Of, I know, and I know she's kind of opting for the for the fours, but I think that's one of the things that if you could kind of ask for things in the sport as a spectator, I'd love that's to see. One. Keely line up in line up in a fifteen. Mm. Yeah, her fifteen hundred meter abilities will continue to be debated. Um, and yeah, no, obviously Riki ran ran pretty strong for third, and yeah, it's kind of more like the Riki we're used to seeing. To be fair, um, and then the only other race really that I mean, women's three thousand Reve ran eight forty four PB, so that was pretty strong. Um, but yeah, I think obviously as well, like we've got. We've got the Celestia Diamond League in, in Poland kicking off today um, when you're listening. And we just, we, it's weird, isn't it? We're just getting reruns of the Olympics, and you, you look at the lineups, they're absolutely stacked. It's basically just Olympic finals. Um, the men's 3000 looks to be absolutely stellar. Mohamed Aragari, Fisher, Inge Brisson, Kajelch is in there, Ronald Quemoy as well, McSwain Mills. Um, it's great. McSwain and Mills must be. Absolutely knackered, but those two are just gonna mm. they're just gonna run themselves into the ground, aren't they? Um Yeah, and then the men's eight hundred as well, it's just another rerun of that final. A Rock, this is where the world record might come, so this year is notoriously a quick track. When Yonyi, Tuau, Hopple, Crestan, Bergen's in there, so it'll be interesting to see what he does. Atui, like just stacked once again. Um so be interested to see what happens in these diamond leagues now. Will people start slowing down or will they just continue to kind of get quicker and build on that Olympic form? So it's a short preview there. Bell and Courtney Bryant and Reve are going to go in the women's fifteen hundred as well, but we won't go. We won't talk about it too much because it'll probably happen by the time most of you are listening. 
Yeah, and then obviously next weekend it's into Rome. Um, Are they starting this out? So I'm just having a look now, mate. Um, see if we can get on some of these. Yeah, we got 3K. Amy Pratt's in the 3K uh, on, on the women's side, obviously. Um, who's in it? Men's 5, Mohamed, Haragawi, Borrega, Fisher, <laughs> Gabriel. Wow. Uh, Nick Griggs is in there. Wow, that that will be that will be an exciting one. Man, that is a baptism of fire. Because, yeah, Jesus look at these. Christ. Obviously, we know how good Nick Griggs is, but his PB of 13-13... It's only him oh and God. two Kenyans who've run outside 13 minutes. And, so Mike, and Mike Foppen, but yeah. Edwin Koga and Ronald Cuomo are both outside 13 minutes as well. But yeah, we know from those guys, particularly Cuomo, that they can go a lot quicker. Um, Whoa. Mate, they are. This is good. This is good from Diamond League. They're announcing Batacletti's going to go into 1500. Yegon's going to go into 1500 in Rome as well. Um, could we see another world record there? Jess Holt won't be running. Has Jess Holt said she's ending her season or something? Because she doesn't seem to be lining up on too many start lists, so... Maybe. But really, Rome is a women's steeple, but men's five, women's 15, and that's that's all there is from kind of distance angles, so that will be underwhelming for us because it's a fast track. Um, it's a great meet. Weather's good. So Yeah, I was literally thinking, what am I doing next weekend? I might see if I can get myself a... Get yourself over there. to Rome, you know. Um, <coughs> maybe, maybe. Um, but yeah, it's it's good, isn't it, mate? Like a few few races, like we're getting some good start. Like, like you say, the Diamond League are really cashing in, making sure they get the big names. Oh yeah, post Olympics, um, and that's that's all we can ask for, really. Like, regardless of uh, whether it matters in in relation to to the big one or not. Um, well, you know, this is it's good entertainment, but this is going to be the last year, I think, that this is going to happen, isn't it? Um, they really want to make sure that. Well, I think worlds will always be at the end of the season going forward mm. um, whether the Olympics will because obviously multi-sports I'm not so sure I don't know what the dates are for LA but you know Worlds next year that'll be it done Yeah, and I, I, we've always said I think that is how it should be you know it does feel even these diamond leagues it's a little bit community shield vibes isn't it it's like it is mate club it world is. cup sort of yeah. stuff um, mate I guess just a little bit more news um New York City Marathon um, announced their fields. <laughs> crazy, 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 crazy stack. I mean, Tola, Olympic champs lining up. Bashir Abdi is lining up there. It's half expecting the mill to be on this start list as well because it seems like everyone who did the Olympic Marathon um, is pretty much lining up as well. You've got Kamwara and Chebet and people um, in there as well. Conor Mance, Clayton and Young are both doing it. Those two, I think they're cashing out some serious... Serious money, to be honest mm. with you, because um, yeah, that's a tight turnaround. It is, mate, and and this is one that look as as an athlete, I'm like, you have to cash in completely, yeah, completely yeah. get it, but surely, surely, surely the organisers, right, and everyone almost knows that this is a bit of a bit of just a procession, you know. I think. I think as an athlete, it's almost worth doing because then I think 2025, we know no one really takes the World Championship Marathon seriously. For a marathon runner, it's almost like, okay, that's the year you can probably take a bit of an off year and take stock um, mm. and really recover and then sort of start to and then start to build and, and look to sort of look ahead, getting, your, you know, whether, you know, Manta Clayton Young, like start trying to attack the American record and, and obviously get qualifying marks at the Olympics, etc. Um but I almost feel like, yeah, like if you can cash in, it's probably good to do now. Um, and then you can almost take like a full year off from marathon running and, and from a build and stuff. But it is brutal because they've obviously had their American trials. They've done the Olympics and then they're doing New York. Three marathons in 12 months. I've said before, I think the shoes are allowing people to have, to just get a little bit greedy when it comes to the marathon. Yeah. And I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what effect, you know, whether that has much of a, positive effect or a negative effect but from what I've seen it you then just cram in in a three four year cycle you've crammed in ten marathons as opposed to kind of like what four, six four to four. six yeah, yeah. Um, but I guess that's that's the it's the nature of all sports right like we're just speaking yeah but I think you're so like community shield weren't we and, and I think your, your longevity yeah. your longevity is less than like yeah. the, the times that you continue to churn out I mean Honestly, like even even when you look at like a pro, like they have maybe have like three or four really good marathons in them, and they, you know, after that, out of ten marathons over like a four year, four five year period, 
yeah. yeah, three or four are really good, and the others are kind of they struggle in the build up. There's always you know there's always problems, um, and that's why Kipchoge was able to stay so good for so long. He never ever did kind of more than two. No, and he did not like differ from that build up plan, which obviously I guess I guess now people might say it's not working, but look, he wasn't ever gonna kind of last forever, and and that is what that sorry is uh, what's allowed him to be so consistent. Um, mate, I'm just looking at in terms of kind of. Road races, looking at these Antrim star lists, uh, star lists for the half as well, and, and some interesting names on here, like Mark Scott's pacing. Oh, it's stacked. Um, Derry Griffiths is in there, like, good to see him back. Ryan Gregson's going, um, the the Aussie. Um, Just keep an eye on the results, ladies and gents. I think they've got four or five sub-60 lined up on the men's side, and yeah, women's side as well is ridiculously stacked. So yeah, just, that would have happened this morning so just keep an eye on those results we'll try and um, keep you posted in our results roundup as well yeah mate but an interesting cho- interesting course because it's on the seafront right and I've always thought like oh Alex really blustery it doesn't look good but I think because the way the cliffs are situated right they, when if the wind comes in from the west apparently athletes are sheltered on that kind of you know, against the cliffs and they run real right up close. So I think that's why it's able to be such a fast course. But on paper, when you look at it, you're like, how the hell is this ever fast? Um, yeah. But yeah, they do continue to deliver kind of time and time again in, in Antrim. Yeah, that's it. I think if you if you catch a good day, then then you are absolutely flying on that course, aren't uh-huh. you? Um, obviously, yeah, just Jeb, Jeb Costco on there off the, uh, on the women's side. Um, obviously, 216 marathon as well so they do they do they do manage to attract kind of your your world elite not just not just kind of oh they've changed the game considering this uh, that 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 half started in um pretty sure the first one they did was covid or just after covid maybe they had it before but that was the first kind of big one where they seem to have elites i mean since then it has you know it is electric um and it does have strong strong lineups every year so credit to those guys um yeah and then i guess women's new york city marathon Terence de Barber. Hello, Biri goes again. Whole host of Americans, as you'd expect, even the ones who kind of went to the Olympics. And Lily Parch is doing it from a from a British angle as well. So Callum Hawkins also doing it for on the on the men's side, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, mate, that's um, I think that's pretty much it for this week. Let's get maybe get, let's get stuck into this. Uh, oh, bit of news: Ben Reynolds off to Virginia Tech to be uh, reunited with um, Ben Thomas. Ben Thomas. Yeah, absolutely, mate. And obviously, look, a name many of you might not know. I guess he's been been around on the BMC circuit a fair bit this year. He has been on the podcast before when he was um, studying at the University of Oregon, but has been also under Ben Thomas there. Yeah, and obviously, kind of came back um, when they when they switched to to Jerry Schumacher, came back to the UK. He's been been training with James Thee for a year or so, and and he's gone back out there to be kind of yeah, like you say, mate, go back to Ben Thomas and. We're just going to say he's one to watch out for. We've said it before, but um, yeah, in terms of some athletes to look out for, he is definitely, definitely yeah. up there. Um, yeah. But yeah, in terms of another athlete to look out for that maybe, maybe I guess not as well known, um, coached by Trevor Painter. Um, so part of that, part of that Keely Hodgkinson group with, with Jenny Meadows as well. She was um, an OG, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, as you'll find out. Yeah, and yeah, she mentioned to us that so Ava Lloyd has trained with that group since she was 12 years old, 19 year old, um, 203 for the 800 and 412 in a 15 she has run. So some fabulous personal best and, and she's heading to Peru for the World Juniors. So great to catch up with her, mate, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and I think some some important kind of lessons for junior athletes out there uh, in terms of progression, but also just a kind of a unique case being in a world-class environment already rather than trying to kind of go and find that world class environment I think yeah that's uh, it's like a, a, a really good takeaway is she's in a very unique position where you know a lot of athletes her age 19, 20 you know that sort of age they're, they're looking for that next step where do they go typically you just go off to university whether that's in the UK you go to love for Birmingham wherever or you go off to America, right? And you just hopefully you get quick enough after that that yeah, maybe you can justify getting a part time job and trying to turn pro, etc. But you know, she's going to go to university in Manchester, stay local. I think as an athlete, it doesn't get more exciting than knowing that the setup you currently have as a junior is good enough to take you all the way to the top, to and not just the top, to like an Olympic champion top. Yeah. Um, 
you know, whether she'll do that, we don't know. But I think that's that's quite a u- unique position. I can't imagine there's too many youngsters out there that, that are in that position. I think really get to get her perspective on like the pressures and, and how the group's changed because she was there before Keeley bef- and people like that and how she's kind of coped with that. So I, and I think, you know, she's done a phenomenal job. And I think obviously Trevor and Jenny are just very good at, really, really good at managing their athletes and working on their mentality and mindset. Yeah, absolutely. But we'll let we'll let Ava do the talking, obviously. So um, thanks for listening to us. Um, enjoy this episode, and we'll catch you very soon. Okay, firstly, Ava, um, thanks for coming on the podcast. Welcome. Um, how are you, first of all? Oh, I'm good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, kind of in the middle of all the preparation. So, yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah, good stuff. And obviously, for those of you listening, maybe preparations for for World Juniors that are in Peru two weeks away. Is that right? Yeah. So we actually fly um, in less than a week. So I haven't got long left with like my coach back here. So it's kind of all in. Um, yeah, prepping. I'm gonna say, how is uh, how's packing going? <laughs> <laughs> not good. Not good at all. I'm getting getting shouted out quite a lot, quite a lot. But I have a few days yet. So I yeah. think everyone in the house needs to calm down. But <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. Um and what is the actually what's been in obviously British Athletics taking a I guess a relatively small team to, to World Juniors, isn't it? It always is though, because the standards are so high. But are you do you have like a mini holding camp, like quite quite a bit of a time difference there as well? Yeah, well, I think I know of a few teams who are actually flying out um like now ish to get mm. um climatized because it is actually a six hour time difference they're six hours behind but we're not actually flying until next friday so we get there um saturday morning like some ridiculous time like 4 a.m or something um so then i only have like three full days to kind of recover before my race <laughs> um, not including the saturday so it's quite a quick turnaround yeah. and i'm lucky i'm not on the tuesday mm. yeah will, will you start kind of moving your time zone over before you leave is that part of the plan um do you go into that much depth you know i have actually thought about it although i think everyone else in my family is probably going to hate me but i think sometimes you know in, in the summer holidays i do tend to wake up a little bit earlier so <laughs> i think yeah i i don't need to make a lot of adjustment but probably some in the next few days especially it's good um and look you'll be running the 1500 um interestingly what's the last it's been a kind of quiet month for for everyone else who wasn't at the olympics hasn't it like there hasn't been too many races going on and you know obviously you won the you won the english champs and you, you booked your spot you nailed your your qualifying standards as well so what has this last month looked like i mean we we're just just talking off air then about did you get out to paris or not to to see the group yeah it's been a lot quieter than um the previous few months i think at the beginning of the season, I was racing quite a lot because I am relatively new to the 15. So we really wanted to get a few races under my belt and obviously nail the qualifier. Um, so I think it was really important to have a bit of downtime and time off racing um, in between, especially while most of the team is out in Paris. It's kind of it's a bit tricky to kind of balance everything um, and like keep in contact with them when they're so busy. So it's been quite nice just to chill and train hard. Um, I did actually do a BMC because it was actually really hard to find races, even if I wanted to do them. Um, so I wanted to do like a fast one after um, securing my spot just to get used to, you know, going out from the gun again, which didn't do quite as well as uh, I was meant to, but it was a decent time. Can't really complain. Yeah. You mentioned kind of being a bit newer to, to the 1500. Is that something that you see yourself, I guess, progressing into or is it going to be 800 and 1500 uh, for the next few years? I always like to keep a balance. Um, I think I've definitely been swayed this year more towards the 15, especially because even though I started to specialise in them last year, I think I was running them off 800 metre training. Um, and then so this year I've done a lot more specific 15 stuff. And the difference has been crazy. I've been like, oh my God, this is just a whole kind of ball game. Um, so I was 
thinking, oh, 100 percent, 15 all the way. Um, but then I did drop down to do two eights and it was actually pretty nice just having to run two laps. I did quite enjoy that quite a lot. So I don't think I'll be letting go of um, dabbling in a bit of both for a good, good. few years. We got we got a purist here. We got, uh, you know, Georgia Bell is proving that, you know, you can do the 8 to 15 and um, you don't have to just specialize in one. Um, but look, you know, after you nailed the standard, it's like you like you said, you had a few quick early season, well, mid season races. Um Preparing for championships, I'm intrigued, you know, does, does training change? Do those workouts change? Like, do you have to start thinking about closing hard or like you said, going off particularly hard? Typically, World Juniors is is always quite daunting the way, you know, those East Africans will just blitz um, the first lap at World Juniors. Yeah, absolutely. I've actually gone into kind of a build block at the moment. So all of the longer stuff that I thought I'd left behind um, in <laughs> Amp and Potch, they've all kind of come back into play. So I'm like, Trevor, this is a bit of, I can't believe you're doing this to me and you're away in Paris and I've got to do this. Um, so that's been a bit of a shock to the system, but it's making sure like my tank's topped up to um, go with those fast paces and my endurance is still there. Um, we actually incorporate a lot of kind of speed change work into our training normally. So it's not like I suddenly have to start doing that. So we will have a lot of sessions um, where we'll have like the last 200 in the rep we have to pick up. So that's quite um, a normal thing that's built in continuously throughout the year by Trevor, which is so it hasn't really been big changes. I think now I'll definitely start. I've started to wind down slightly on the um intensity mm. to just to make sure i freshen up for the champs mm. hey, you mentioned topping up some of that longer stuff what what does that look like specifically for someone kind of at your stage in career like what sort of volume are you doing kind of in, in the winter um, and what does that look like kind of in terms of reps and things like that as well yeah so um like i said i've actually gone up quite a bit this year compared to what I used to do I think my mileage last year must have been in the winter maybe I was hitting about 40 miles a week as my max and then in the summer it was like 25 um, whereas this year some of my winter blocks I was reaching like 45 to 50 mm -hmm. um, which is quite a lot for me I was struggling out there it was not enjoyable sometimes um, and now at the minute um, I think it's about I'll probably be at about 35, maybe hitting 40, 45 on the very rare occasion in the summer. Um, but we've, I've had a lot more of, um, we do like, it's called like a gears run. And it's kind of like a progressive tempo for 50, 60 minutes straight in like a triangle. Or it can be all over the place. Mm. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a triangle. That is very grueling. Um, so I put a lot of my endurance down to those runs because if you can get through them, then you're gonna run well um we also have like a stadium loop so we do like a uh it's like a 1k loop um around the stadium and we do a lot of reps around there and they're like 1k and up um sometimes it's like eight minute reps and you, you kind of you can tell when we all have that kind of session because everyone turns up to training you know not exactly bubbly and raring to go so <laughs> It's, it's actually fascinating hearing you say about the, you know, one, the longer reps, but two, that kind of 60, 50 minute kind of hard consistent run. Because I think, you know, mileage wise, um, you know, I guess Trevor's group and and the group you're in, everyone sees them as quite, quite low mileage, but clearly they still do, you know, endurance work, obviously not across the whole week, but that's a big, you know, that sounds like quite a big, strong session, which like you said, you've, you've clearly had a lot of success from and put do you do you put kind of your performance in the way you've been able to hold your performance throughout the whole summer kind of down to those sorts of workouts yeah I think um we are kind of known for like the lactic mm. lactic sessions and I've um speaking to people from other groups when I tell them some of their sessions like oh my god what do you mean you get like five minutes or even eight minutes recovery between reps and track sessions um, I think they think we're a bit crazy sometimes but I think there definitely has been um, a change in the training this year for me personally and I think I was quite shocked by how much of an effect I actually felt that in my ability over the 15 mm. um, 
because even some I've been doing longer track sessions like I'd never ran above a 600 meters as a rep on a track and then you know in January I was made to do I think 1200 meters and it almost killed me um <laughs> I definitely say that's had such um an effect on kind of my 15 racing it's just I've seen like an improvement I could never I could never have expected from I think it's like psychologically as well like you, you, you kind of you're now comfortable with with kind of racing a 15 hard from the get-go when when you're kind of doing those longer hard intervals right yeah so I was always quite good at the more um endurance stuff but our, like I said our endurance work we do the gears run down like a canal or a trail or we do 1k reps or longer we do it around like a road staging loop uh, we'd never do those long reps on a track so I mm. think also doing the longer stuff on the track it's helped me a lot um, mentally to kind of keep focus especially in that third lap in the mm -hmm. 15 so that's usually where it all went wrong for me but mm -hmm. I've managed to up my game with it this year yeah and, and speaking about that kind of the, the mental health I guess what's it like having ladies like Keely like Georgia Bell in your group doing the training I, I pre presume quite similar training to yourself how much of a I guess boost does that give you um, kind of entrusting your training well I'm not gonna lie sometimes it's pretty terrible you know if you're having a bad session in that group it's you're pretty far out the back but then you just have to remind yourself like the caliber of the kind of girls that you're running with and you're like oh okay it's not it's not actually that terrible it's just you know sometimes you can get dropped pretty badly um but especially after um for example like Georgia and Sarah came back from Paris and I think there was a session and I must have been it was on the track I can't remember what reps were doing I was pretty far behind and then I'm like even if I'm 10 seconds behind that's still like 406 kind of and mm. I'm not saying that I'm in that shape but that's what I, I had to, you know you have to kind of put it in perspective the kind of people you are training with and then the plan that I'm doing all the sessions like look what it can um evolve into you know mm -hmm. if you put that work in and you like carry on trusting all the training and then trusting Trevor and Jenny's guidance you know it's nice to see the progression um like on paper and like in front of you and the evidence that it does work yeah I think it's an interesting dynamic, certainly for, for someone like yourself. Do you feel like you have an expectation to deliver, to kind of be the level you are at just because of being associated with that group? Like, is there pressures about being in the group and kind of delivering? Um, I've never really felt it, to be honest, um, because I think I was kind of in the group before it all kicked off. Mm. Um, I think I've kind of, because so I've seen everyone kind of come into the group because I was uh trained by Trevor before Keely was you're an OG yeah <laughs> since like 2017 so it's been really kind of obviously it's been really nice seeing them all come in but I think just I think the only thing it does is bring kind of confidence I've never felt like a pressure or anything to perform just because I'm in the same training group as those guys or because I'm mm. trained by Trevor and Jen um if anything it's just it's really like uplifting to kind of see the results that they're pumping out and then you know really believe in what I can do mm -hmm. and how is it that you got into the group in the first place is it right that your that your mum was coached by Trevor before um no she wasn't coached by him she was in the same group with him okay. um, they were both in like Wigan Harriers together um so when I started I think it was high school, so I was year seven. Um, it was the beginning of 2017, um, and I think I won, like, a cross-country race in PA or something. And I was kind of winding down, so I never did any kind of CV sports before that. Um, I did, like, gymnastics and dancing. Um, so I won this race. I'm like, oh, this is, this is quite nice. I kind of, kind of want to join the club. And then my mum was like, oh, well, I know exactly who to call. And I think she actually had to beg Trevor to, like, let me join in one session a week. So I was like, I'm not taking on a 12-year-old. Um, so gradually I was, like, one session a week um, in 2017. And then 
kind of I built on that obviously got more and more attached to the group mm. and it's completely changed since I started I think there's only one other sprinter um, Ashley Nemitz who was in the group when I started who's still here now um so uh, yeah I've never had another coach apart from Trevor um, wow yeah. it's actually so cool because I we didn't realize this at all and I don't think many people would have would have realized this um your relationship with Trevor and Jenny, like obviously it would have changed over time, you know, from when you're 12, 13 year old to, to what you are now, 19 years of age. But have 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 they changed at all? Obviously, there's been a lot of change who's come and gone from the group. But, you know, talk about how that relationship's developed. Yeah. So I think at first, obviously, Trevor, it was kind of like, oh, I'm taking on this kid. It's <laughs> kind of my group's like pretty serious um and then when I actually started Jenny was still um training uh, as like for pacemaking duties mm -hmm. so she was still very much like a um, active member of the group at that time um and I think it's been really nice because they've seen my development throughout my entire um career in the sport so far and I think I've you know learn to really trust them and I can really kind of work with them very well and communicate everything um you know so I'm like Trevor I think that might be a little bit too much for me um or oh, very good at like yeah working out what's best for me really um because we've tried so many different things over the years and then the dynamic with Jenny has definitely changed a lot because she went from kind of an active member in the group and then she took a bit of, she wasn't really involved as much. Um, she did a lot of commentating, um, but now the past year or so, she's been become a lot more heavily involved with the group. Um, and I think that's just made a huge change having them as kind of like a team together you know you turn up to training and it's both of them and Trevor's so good with the technical aspects and stuff and the plan um and I can really talk to him about that and then Jenny um kind of brings in the, the experience and having lived through all of that herself so together they make a really good really good pair and yeah like I said I really trust them and um because I've basically grown up with them since I started mm. running. Mm. Yeah, and obviously cle clearly working so far, and I'm sure you'll kind of have success with that group for, for many years to come. But let's talk about the setup. Like, Obviously, you've got, you mentioned kind of, you've got a number of athletes in the group. Do you all kind of train together at the same time? How many different sessions are going on at each time? You mentioned, obviously, um, Trevor and Jenny were both away. Like, who's looking after the group when they're away in terms of kind of how, how it runs and things like that? Yeah, so I honestly don't know how they do it sometimes um, because we have like uh, Gloria, who's a 100 meter sprinter, all the way up to kind of um, some 3K, 5K athletes. So sometimes, it, especially once we move into track season where everyone's trying to do like event specific stuff, it can be a bit of carnage. And I don't even know how that, how they manage that sometimes. Trevor's got about three stopwatches in his hand and you're like, oh my God, he's like running from left to right across the track. Um, they do manage it very well though. If they know they've got a lot of sessions, um, they'll both come down. And then there's actually, um, there's a guy called Darren Borthwick, who's um, Emily Borthwick, the high jumper. He's her dad and he helps out a lot. And he's kind of like the assistant coach. So while they were off in Paris, he took on a lot of the sessions while we were back at home and made sure everyone was kind of still had the motivation up to come to training and we'd still kind of come together and do it. Um, I think a lot of the time it's the camps where um, we kind of really thrive as a group because we have like a few international athletes like um, Anne-Marie from Denmark and then Georgia um, kind of comes, mm. she does come quite often to train with us, um, but especially on camps, you know, she's there for every single session. Um, so even though we do have kind of athletes who Trev and Jen kind of coach remotely, we do see them quite often mm. and, everyone kind of we always like to make an effort to come together as a group and train because you can always tell like everyone has a better session when uh, kind of everyone's there rather than just one or two yeah i'm sure 
I, I reckon so many people can relate to that. Um, I just think it must be so inspiring for someone like yourself to sort of, yeah, you're, you're out on the track, you know, you're putting yourself through it. Um, you look over and, and so, is, you know, the Olympic champion, so is the Olympic bronze medalist. Um, it must just be crazy. But, um, but I think something which stands out for me is like, especially with, with Trevor and Jenny in the group, and you might be able to talk on this a little bit. It's just like, you guys don't seem to have any limits on yourselves. Um, and I think like Georgia Bell's kind of highlighted that this year, almost the way she's come into things is limitless. And you, you made a big jump this year as well. So, you know, at the start of the season, are you talking kind of goals with, with Trevor and Jenny? Are you going, I want to run X time? Um, or do you just kind of go, you know, I want to execute this amount of training and, and that will lead to a good time. Cause I just feel like anyone who comes through that group just, Yeah, seems to just have so much belief in themselves and just pushes themselves until they basically can't anymore and whatever that is. Yeah, so at the end of like every track season, we kind of, every kind of member does like an end of season review. Mm. Um, so we go back over the season with Trevor and Jenny and like talk about what we think worked well, um, what we were a bit disappointed with, what we wanted to kind of, we wish we did a bit more and what we want to take into the next season. And I think that kind of reflection that, really helps so much with the kind of attitude and building into the next season and um I think just seeing it how like each kind of every person in the group has in some way you know kind of broken through any kind of expectation mm. that they originally thought like it started with Keely arguably in 2021 when she Um, won the silver and then you kind of see it's you see it just replicated so often and then because you know you're doing that training and you're there with those people on a daily basis it kind of comes just a normal aspect that you know you shouldn't really think oh well this is the fastest I can run mm. and I think Trev and Jen they do place a heavy importance on stats so after every session even if there's about five different sessions, they'll make sure that everyone knows the times that they ran in the session. And from that, you can kind of get the confidence and like you're in shape um, rather than just being like, oh, I don't really know what I want, R ran, I felt good. Um, whereas they're very good at being like, right, so you ran this, this time, like that is very indicative that you can run, you're in mm. such and such shape if everything went perfectly well. Um, so I think that's, super super important as well um but a lot of the time a lot of people run 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 faster than that anyway um mm. yeah no no it, it certainly seems that way you know you're you always seemed quite shocked um you know how how fast you guys can run and and is, is that something has that ever worked I guess negatively you know when you keep when you get handed those splits and and you know what they mean has has it ever kind of had a bit of reverse psychology and you you've walked away disappointed Yeah, so I think last year I was training really, really well, um, but I just couldn't see that replicated in kind of races. Um, I just get really stressed and it was more like the mental aspect. And it can be quite difficult when you're seeing all these times on paper and you're like, you know, that's indicative of a certain time or in a certain shape and you just can't seem to deliver that on the track. And it can be really hard um but I think that's a very like individual thing and you have to kind of sometimes accept it and just like just keep going with it and mm. kind of trust the entire process so even though I probably would have liked to run faster this year it's just meant I've taken more off my time last year this year when it has eventually paid off sometimes so it can be difficult but I think I'd argue that like the confidence from seeing all the stats can definitely like outweigh the negative side of it. And I've learned as well over the years, because this is the kind of process that I've been brought up, kind of, I've been brought up like through the sport, looking at my stats and like, oh, this is what this means. I'm, I've become very good at like shutting it off. So mm -hmm. there was like a race prep session that I did before my first 800 in the season. And that, I was on my own because everyone else was doing like a 1k session 
outside the track and it was raining, horrible weather. My stats must have been appalling, but I didn't even open the sheet at uh, the speed <laughs> point. So I was like, I, so I can, I'm very good at ignoring them when I know it sometimes as well. Yeah, one thing we wanted to chat about as well, obviously kind of we mentioned already, like a junior athlete, 19 years of age, you're, I guess, top of your age group, but most people your age are trying to figure out how they make the the step or or the change perhaps um, to kind of get to that elite level. Being in the group you're in, um, I guess, do you feel like you have everything you need staying where you are to make it to the top or or do you have any plans in the future to kind of go elsewhere for a bit, come back? I'm, I'm not sure. No, I don't think I'll be moving anytime soon, really. Um, they call it like the pipeline, um, Trev and Jen, so they have like a pipeline of athletes and you can't, it's just, like I said, you can just see the progression out in front of you. Whereas some coaches, if you're training really well, but you can't quite see how they'd take you to that next level and you'd make that jump with that training that you're doing. Whereas it's quite, it's just out there for you to see, like anyone can see it with Trev and Jen. Um, and I think that's really reassuring in itself with even with the level that I'm at at the minute um and like you said about the like the unexpectedness you just you don't know especially with the training that we're doing like I didn't really expect to be in the shape that I'm in this year um so yeah I think I'm planning I'm going to uni in Manchester because I didn't really want to move anywhere else um I didn't really want to leave the group especially now that there's so many girls in it and when you're training with them it's just it's just unreal really and I think I've gotten so much out of that this past year I wouldn't really want to uh, leave that behind me oh 100 percent. actually yeah just talk about like the the amount of high class high caliber women in the group and you know a lot of a lot of professional women might use kind of men to help pacemaking and stuff but you guys really are just a core core group of women really aren't you um and that it, that must be quite powerful yeah it's really nice um everyone can kind of just believes in each other and everyone really gets along and you know you can just see how everyone works together so much like Georgia and Sarah this year they've both come on in like leaps and bounds because in the camps you know they especially in the long stuff you just see them out front like battling and it's just really mm. cool to watch we do have a few um, male athletes in the group. No, I, yeah, you do actually. Unless, yeah, name them, name them. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we have like Oscar Schofield. He's usually out front. Um, but there's a few like Charlie Hobson and Joe Rizgara. I think they went out to Paris with some of the girls to train with them while they were out there, um, which was really nice. And then my younger brother, actually, he had a bet on with Keeley this year. Uh, because they're quite similar in training so uh she said she'd give him 50 quid if she ran faster than what she did by the end of the season and unfortunately i think he's just missed out so he had he <laughs> ran 155 six in berry i think so yeah second off he wasn't too happy about that he could have done with the money he said but so everyone does it's a really nice dynamic everyone mm. works really well to work together together mm. Yeah, wow. What a what an environment eh, to be kind of <laughs> growing up and, and having having bets with the uh, bets with the Olympic champ on who's gonna <laughs> run quicker that season. But um <laughs> look, a Ava, it's been been great to chat to you, but just before we finish, what are what are the goals then for, for World Juniors um this season? Um I think just not to have a repeat of last year. Last year for Jerusalem, I went in, had no expectations, my main goal was to make it. And then I got on the star line and I was totally overwhelmed and didn't yeah. believe that I could be competitive at all. Whereas this year, I, I just want to go and I want to believe that I can be competitive and mix it with the best girls in the world. And I want to be, I want to be looked at as a competitor and you know that I can be dangerous on that scene. And yeah, like you said, have no, have no limits to what I can yeah. really achieve on a stage like that. Has that just been, you know, has that confidence, that change in mindset since Jerusalem, has that happened, um, 
through training or you, you just kind of a lot of self-talk um, and a lot of confidence being built kind of on your mental side? Definitely a bit of both. I think I've had to work a lot on the mental side this year. And I think that's had so much um, effect on like my training as well. And they've both kind of gone hand in hand. And I just, every time I'd have a bad session, I just think back to my sit and no kick tactic in the final where I just sat at the back, didn't do anything. I was just like, oh, I'm happy to be here. And then, so I was just like, I cannot have that happen again. And I think that's something that I really taken through with me into this year that I don't want to happen again yeah I'm intrigued has the has those kind of you working on your mentality is that is that just you um against you you know or is that have you been working with a psychologist or anything like that because one of the big things I think is not enough younger athletes actually work on their mindset because it's like this time in your life is just crucial. Like you said, it, it being able mm-hmm. to step up when you're 20, 21, 22, um, having a good mindset now is crucial to that development. Yeah, absolutely. I I have started working with um, a psychologist, psychologist this year. So I've had quite a few sessions um, throughout. It's not loads. It's maybe like once a month, if mm-hmm. that. But I found that that's, just been unbelievably helpful when it's come to my training and especially competition dealing with nerves and stress and like self-belief it's just made a world of a difference and then that paired with um talking to Jenny a lot about it about her own experiences Mm. I think it's I can't even say what um well obviously you can see the improvement that it's made but yeah that's that's great to hear and obviously we wish you the best um at worlds and, and thanks for coming on the podcast oh no thank you for having me it's been great